your power. I see, I see your glory, Lord. I see your glory. I see, I see your glory. I see, I see your power. I see. got some memory work to do. How many of you feel like your brains still work? All right, Marsha, that's it. <laughs> All right, we're going to memorize the word together, Marsha. Uh, it says in Romans 8, 37, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I, I overheard a conversation this morning between Bob and Jennifer and Reuben, and they were talking about, do we pick up the sword or don't we? Right? Isn't that what you were talking about? Do we battle or don't we do battle? Yeah, the Old Testament was saying, fight, fight, fight. Yeah, so, so what do we do with a verse like this? 
Old Testament says, fight, fight, fight. And Jesus said to put down the sword. One sword was enough. You know, the, the one to take off Malchus's ear was enough, right? And Jesus did a miracle and healed that guy and kind of nullifies that violence. So what do we do with a verse that says we're more than conquerors? I mean, that sounds very militant, doesn't it? Yet in all these things, we're more than conquerors. But I don't believe it, it's a sword forged in, in, in a mill. I, I believe it's the sword of the Spirit of the living God. That we wield the only offensive weapon that God has given us, the Word of God. That we conquer uh, principalities, powers in dark places that are cooking up violence and wickedness and all sorts of things to keep us away from the will of God. And we know it. We can feel it. Some neighborhoods you walk into, you're like, I feel the darkness. And God says, yeah, but we're more than conquerors in this darkness. We don't have to fall to uh, the victim place, but we can rise up out of the darkness to be a child of God in all of these things, to be more than a conqueror through Christ. So he is alerting us to the situation, not necessarily removing you. That is the miracle all after all. That God doesn't remove you from situations. He keeps you in them and transforms you. In other words, when you get saved, you don't get raptured and just taken out of the world. You're still in the world. You still have a mother-in-law. You still have to do life. Like, it's rough. And the reality is that God says, we can do this. You are, you're not only a conqueror. You're more than a conqueror. That, to me, sounds like we get to sit at the table... Hear the instruction of the general. Here's what it's going to look like. Here's how it's going to go down. And you win the battle. You get to put your uh, foot on the, the neck of the giant. Whatever it, that is. And slay it. To the glory of God. Are you with me? Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Who loved us. Romans 8.37 so we're in this sense this month uh, talking about being propelled. That is that you're in one spot spiritually and all of a sudden it feels like you're sucked into a vacuum and all of a sudden you're dealing with a whole new set of circumstances that you never planned on dealing with. Can anyone identify with that? Like just a few weeks ago you were in one place and now all of a sudden you're in this place and God's saying, I did that to you. And it's uncomfortable, to say the least, because we are creatures of comfort. We like stability. We like predictability. We like to know that someone's not sitting in my seat on Sunday morning, that <laughs> that seat is open and available for me. We, we like same similitude. And man, when someone's in your seat, that just that throws the whole church off. Because now you've got to sit somewhere else, and now you're in someone else. Oh, it's just a mess. The reality is, is God is constantly upsetting the apple cart. Saying, don't get too comfortable here. This is not your home. Hope I'm not the first to tell you that. This is not your home. The scriptures clearly teach we're aliens and strangers just passing through. Our eternity, our home is with God in eternity in a place that we would call heaven. Right? Right? Some of us already have loved ones there. How many of you have loved ones already there? Waiting for you. Experiencing the glory of God. Waiting your arrival. Don't you want to stand with them when God says to you, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter in to the joy that God has for you. So speaking of being propelled and moving forward this particular uh, week, we want to talk about Waves. There, there are waves, spiritually speaking, physically speaking, things that just knock us down. And I know that wave, the power of water and waves is very powerful. Not the trickle we feel down here in the Gulf of Mexico. I'm talking about if you go to other parts of the planet where there are real waves. 
you know, three, four, five, six foot waves, places where surfers gather. I mean, these waves can be ridden on or they can be uh, the, 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 the thing that knocks you down. It all depends on what you do with the wave in your life. Are you with me? The, the, the song Amazing Grace, are you all familiar? Hopefully you've been alive on the planet long enough and somewhere, somewhere you heard the song Amazing Grace. The third stanza to me really stands out. It says this, Through many dangers, toils, and snares, we have already come. Was grace that brought us safe thus far. What he's saying is you should already be dead. The stuff you've been through should have killed you. I can't tell you how many people I've had face-to-face -face conversations with, their drug of choice, fentanyl and heroin, and they're still alive. They have come through dangers, toils, and snares, and grace brought them this far. They're not dead yet. I, phenomenal to me, because those are killers ingested into the human body, and yet they're still alive. And you can say, why? Because God's grace, the grace of God, amazing grace, inexplicable to us. Dangers, toils, snares, he's brought us thus far, and grace will lead us home. The same grace that saved you out of it is the same grace that leads you through it. Are you getting the message? So there's no magical formula. There's not a memory verse level that you get to. It is the grace of God. Your gift from God is that you're going to make it through toils, snares, trials, tribulations, difficulties. You don't get an escape from it when you get saved. You get to learn how to go through it and come out on the other side. Amen? It will lead you home. Um, there's another song that we have not sung in this church, nor have I heard it sung in any church for a long time. I, I want to read the lyrics to you. It says this, Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before Christ, the royal master, leads us against the foe. Forward into the battle, see his banner go. Y'all want to sing it? <laughs> Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as the war with the cross of Jesus going on before. As the sign of tri Trump triumph, Satan's host doth flee. Oh, then, Christian soldiers, on to victory. Hell's foundations quiver at the shout of praise. Brothers, lift your voices, loud your anthems raise. I just want to take a preaching point out of this right here. When we worship, make hell scared of you. I mean, make them afraid to say, we don't want to get around Calvary. They're weird. The, their worship is such at a pinnacle that it makes hell back off. You want that in your life. That's what this onward, move forward. Don't let the waves, the distraction, the whatever knock you down. There are some stuff. We have some mess in this church. Each one of you represents it. Your story, your testimony, the stuff you have been through, and God looks you square in the face and says, onward. No time for, for, for laying on the sidelines. I'll be healing you. I'll be transforming you. Onward. Onward to victory. You praise in the middle of that. Say it, say it better. David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be on my lips. But pastor, you don't know what I've been through. No, I don't. I'm sure it was traumatizing. I'm sure it was gut-wrenching. But God loves you, and He is going to see you through this tumult this toil, this snare, this tribulation. On the other side, the grace that brought you through is the grace that will lead you home. Now the devil wants you to quit, give in to some vice, depend on that, and somehow uh, be strewn in the path of life as one more mess. Now in the church, how are we going to do this? How are we going to do this? Onward. Onward, Christian soldier. 
like a mighty army, moves the church of God. Brothers, we are treading where the saints have trod. We are not divided, all one body we, one in hope and doctrine, one in charity. Onward then, ye people, join our happy throng. Blend with ours your voice in the triumph song. Glory, laud, and honor unto Christ the King. This through countless ages, men and angels sing. I, I don't, I'm trying to be kind, but I feel like the church has gotten fat and lazy. And this kind of mantra is not ours. We, we've dropped the flag of the cross and we've picked up social gatherings instead. And I, I don't know, I think God's reinserting this into the voice of the church to say, no, onward. Onward. We, we're, we're not going to have a kumbaya circle. This is war. The enemies of hell are trying to kill you and the only thing that will matter is onward in the grace of God. Onward in the triumph of God. Onward in the victory of God in the face of things that are trying to slam you to the ground. So what do kayaks and boats and vessels of water have to do with any of this? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> Although this is not a kayak story, it involves watercraft and paddles. I was a mere 17-year-old and I was invited to go whitewater rafting with a group of high school friends. Sounds like a great idea, doesn't it? The story can only go good. Bunch of punks out on a whitewater raft. Uh, we get to a park known in uh, southwestern Pennsylvania on, on the tri-state border between Ohio and West Virginia is a park called Ohio Pile. And at Ohio Pile, there is a river that flows through there known as the Yakagani River. Um, after winter time and after the spring rains, the Yakagani River runs wild. Can you, do you all have this in your imagination? Complete with uh, rapids and what the uh, website refers to as um, level four rapids. There's only six levels. Level six is for complete experts. Do not try this at home. All right, level five is near export. We were in level four is what I was invited to go into. Now, I thought that we would get there and there would be, you know, some gray-haired guy giving us all the rules. Now, there was a gray-haired guy there and he said, has anyone ever whitewater rafted before in your group? And one guy raised his hand. He said, go ahead, guys, you're in the water. <laughs> Great. Great. This, so we have, we have one resident expert, all 17 years old of him, <laughs> and the rest of us. He says, go ahead, boys, you're going to have a good time out there. They hand us a, a life jacket that has seen probably a million bodies before me. So, you know, it's used. <laughs> it doesn't have a new car smell on it. It has nervous sweat for, from millions of people all, all over it. And, and you drape this thing over you and you're like, is there a helmet? <laughs> no, no, no helmet. You're from western Pennsylvania, young man. Toughen up. Get in the, get in the, get in the raft and go. So uh, we get in the raft and when they put us in the water, they put us in the water in a very gentle part of the river. I mean, it was easy like Sunday morning. <laughs> I thought, you know, this, well, this isn't going to be so bad. I, I thought this is, this is going to be a great trip. But you know, your auditory kicks in. You can hear what's coming. You hear the thunder of, of rapids, water under tremendous pressure and power bouncing off of rocks, and I'm not talking like smooth, edgy stuff. Rocks that if it gets you in the side of the head, will say, you died here, and they'll circle your name. <laughs> I mean, this seems like a violent thing, and I'm looking at the others in the, in the craft with me there, 
And then I looked at our resident expert, and I said, we're dead. <laughs> yeah, I came here to die. Um, this is going to be great. Um, someone called my mom. This is pre-cell phone, by the way. <laughs> Actually, pay phones did hang on the walls at those points. And uh, someone called my mom. I'm going I'm to write my phone number on my body. Hopefully, it's still intact. And, and you call this number. Let my mom know I died here at Ohio Powell. So all of a sudden, you, you feel it. You're getting sucked in, into the power of the water. And actually, the guy that had been before knew what he was doing. I was shocked. And so he was sitting in what would be called the captain position. He was up near the back of the, of the craft, and he was doing the steering with his paddle. The rest of us had one instruction. He screamed at us for 45 minutes, Paddle! 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 Paddle harder! Paddle! And for 45 minutes, I bounced. Did I mention the average water temperature is 60 degrees in the Yalkagani River? I, we're not talking lounging at the Gulf of Mexico. Where we don't put our foot in the water until at least 80 degrees. In wintertime, we're like, nah. <laughs> 60 degrees, and that's August. <laughs> you know, that's, that's summer. Oh, we're going to cool off. And I was, you know, I think in high school I weighed all of 90 pounds. So I was, I was shivering like a, I think my bones sound like a game of Yahtzee, and, you know, when you shake them. <laughs> My bones were rattling. I was soaked. I was mad that I got in a boat with my friends that wanted to kill me. And, and just when you have the thought that I'm going to lunge this paddle in his throat and end his life, all of a sudden we came into calm water. And we were high-fiving. <laughs> yes! Like we had conquered our foes. There, we were indestructible human beings. That we came through this and we were out on the other side. We were jumping in and out of the boat like we were experts. And I knew next time I can bring anyone I want. Because they're going to let me go through. And I'm going to be the captain next time. And I'm going to scream at people, Paddle! Now I've asked myself since then, why would any reasonable human being do that? And then God gets a hold of you and says, well, that's what I do to everybody. You come to the cross, they're playing just as I am without one plea. In case you don't know, that's what they play at the altar call for Billy Graham. Thousands of people turn their hearts to Jesus Christ after the preaching of the gospel. And it's easy like Sunday morning. I mean, getting saved is beautiful. It's wonderful. And then you go out in the parking lot. And you can hear what's coming. If you've got ears to hear, you know the road up ahead, even though you just got saved, is filled with tumult, waves, Powerful things that can take you out. And you've got to know that either the wave takes you out or you get on top of it and figure out how to paddle! <laughs> paddle harder! So we're going to talk about this this morning. I want to take you to Isaiah chapter 54. And we're going to learn some spiritual truths that apply to the same concept. Are you with me? So in this being propelled, in this forward, fast movement, there's waves. There's powerful currents. There's the tumult of things being thrown at you that are uncomfortable, unpredictable. And you've got to be thinking at some level spiritually, God, can't you get me out of this? And look what he says in Isaiah 54, starting in verse 16. Behold, I have created the blacksmith who blows the coals in the fire, who brings forth an instrument for his work, 
and I have created the spoiler to destroy. No weapon forged against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Amen. Now, now, did you just hear what I heard? He just said that weapons are going to be forged against us. You back it up to the previous verse. God says, I made the blacksmith who made the fire to make the equipment. I made the spoiler, the one that is out to destroy your life. I created all of it. Doesn't that sound strange? To read that from the Bible, that God says, I made all of it. I made the people that make the instruments to destroy your life, and I put them in your life. However, no weapon forged against you will prosper. What a concept. That even though there are people in this world, you're related to them, they're friends with you, you might even be married to one of these folks that are a destroyer. And God says, I made them. They are destroyers. And the things that they say, the things that they do to you are intended to destroy. However, because you're mine, because you're my child, and we have a relationship together, no weapon that they forge in the fire will ever work. Come on, that's good. I mean, let the Bible stand. That's good. Isaiah is saying it powerfully that no weapon forged against you will be able to accomplish its goal. He goes on to say that we always think it's physical, but all of a sudden he makes it about language. I know that we, we said as, as children, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words never hurt me. But I've talked to so many damaged people because the power of words have picked apart who they really are. And they don't know who they are anymore because of the power of words. And God says, let me tell you something. No matter what thing they say against you, you will be able to refute it. Whatever judgment they bring against you, whatever they say against you, you will be able to refute it because I am with you. Amen. Come on, are you alive? Amen. So the wave, the tumult, are forged instruments. Someone planned your demise. They were cooking it up. They wanted you to die. They wanted to destroy your life. They were doing this. Your family is like, how did you even get hooked up with this person? And God is saying, don't worry. It was all part of my plan. So that I could show my power against it. That no weapon forged against my daughter Rachel will win. You hear me, Rachel? No weapon. No matter what the devil had planned for you. It will not work because you are a child of God. Now, if you don't walk in that divine protection, good luck. If you're not a child of God, these are not your promises. You're going through life, and it's knocking you down. And you keep trying to stand back up, and it knocks you down again. And you wonder, why can't I get my footing? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. And the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. Onward, Christian soul. Onward. Keep moving forward. No weapon forged against you will prosper. I love, I, I, I love rehearsing this. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. And I know there's always people that want to say, well, that's the Old Testament. Pastor Kevin, he's, he's talking to Israelites. Now hold your pants there. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. This is an example of the Old Testament preaching the promises of the new. This is the heritage. In other words, 
You aren't the first to do it. All the way back into the first family, the Israelites, they have been doing it. Ever since then, more and more people are walking out the heritage of the Lord, recognizing that no weapon forged against you will prosper, even though God lets it happen. I'm trying to preach a valid point here. God's not going to take them out, no matter how hard you pray for Him to kill them. He is going to let them reside and be a reminder to you, that was the old life, I walk with Jesus. And no matter what that person says to me, or does to me, or tries to accomplish, it will not prevail. I am a child of God. That is your heritage. Do you wish to walk in it, is the question. Now let's move on to the New Testament. Let's go on to Mark chapter uh, 6. I want to take you there. Mark chapter 6, and we're going to see this played out in actual water, wave, and boat. And watch how the disciples deal with this situation. Maybe this, maybe this could be a sub-title uh, for this sermon, but whatever was set out to destroy you, wave or what have you, can now become your red carpet. What, what was intended to knock you down could be the thing that now walks you to your destiny. Uh, we, we have a, a picture of Jesus doing that very thing in this chapter of how your wave can now become your red carpet, walking you to your destiny. Uh, let's see it in action. Mark chapter 6, uh, verses 45 to 52. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea, and would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost, and cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he went up into the boat to them, and the wind ceased. And they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure, and marveled. For they had not understood about the loaves, because their heart was hardened. When they had crossed over the land of Genesaret and anchored there, and when they came out of the boat immediately, the people recognized him ran through the whole surrounding region and began to carry about on beds those who were sick to wherever they heard he was. Wherever he entered into the villages, cities, or country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him were made well. Now Mark leaves out something. I mean, this is told in Matthew chapter 14 and in John chapter 6. Now Mark ironically leaves out the story that Peter says to Jesus, if it's you, bid me to come out on the water. And Jesus says one word, come. And Peter also gets out of the water and walks. Now, now let's talk some facts here. Let, let's talk... Um, some language that's in this passage. One of them that jumped out to me is that Jesus came out on the water at the fourth watch of the night. Now what was going on prior to that was uh, Jesus wanted to preach and he was out in the middle of the wilderness and, and thousands of people followed him out into the wilderness. And Jesus preaches all day to them and the disciples start to notice that the people are hungry. And so they come to him and say, Lord, we need to dismiss the crowd. It's time for dinner. And Jesus says to them, you feed them. 
that's great, but no one stopped at Chick-fil-A. It's Sunday, and they're closed. All right, so we've got no ability to handle this situation. And about that time, Andrew finds a boy with a lunch. Of course, we know, five loaves, two fish, and Jesus says, that's enough. All right, look, I've been through the drive through with my family. One bag only causes a fight. One bag is never enough for Jonathan, Savannah, and Charlie. I can't order one kid's meal. That would be murder on sight. <laughs> one for each. One bag for each. And Jesus has the audacity to say, it's, it's a bag will do. Lifts it heavenward, blesses it, tells the disciples, pass it out. 5,000 people eat from the distribution of one bag. I want to watch that one on video. They just keep reaching in the bag. Here's a fish for you, evidently. There's still more. And they just keep reaching in, and it just keeps feeding. And I, I love in the other passages, it says that there were scraps. People just, oh, I'm stuffed. And just threw it to the side. And so it's been a long day. I don't know if you've ever been a part of an all-day ministry event, but they're exhausting. And then inevitably someone says to you, well, now it's time to clean up. And you want to strangle that person and say, who put you in charge? Because my body already hurts. I'm already mentally, physically exhausted. You want me to clean up? Well, they do. And they clean up 12 basketfuls of leftovers. And after they're done, Jesus says, Listen, guys, get in the boat. Meet me on the other side. Well, what are we dealing with? Geographically, we're dealing with the Sea of Galilee. And if you want to know... Uh, a little fact here, it's about 30 miles in diameter. So this is a pretty big, significant pond, wouldn't you say? 30 miles in diameter, and they're told to get into a rowboat and go to the other side. Well, I don't know if you've been doing the calculating. They were an all-day ministry event. They're tired and exhausted, and they've just cleaned up, and now they're super tired, and Jesus says, go get in a boat and row. Well, for how long? Now, I, I went and I did a little research in the vessel that they would have been using on a pleasant, sunny day with favorable winds. It would take about six hours to row from one point to the other. Now, I don't know if you feel like getting in a rowboat after a long day of ministry and working all day and cleaning up everybody's food scraps into 12 baskets, and then you get in a boat and the winds are not even favorable, it looks like stormy skies. And Jesus says, meet me on the other side. Well, that's nice, Jesus. What are you going to be doing? Well, it says that, you know, Jesus just did so, a few little things. He dismissed the crowd. I don't know if you've ever been on the pastoral end of dismissing a crowd, but people don't leave. You see? There are some people, I say amen, and they're in front of the television watching the NFL. I get it. They're gone. Some people have to beat the Baptist to the Golden Corral. I get it. You've you got to get over there. I see. I understand. Uh, speaking of that, I just want to take a moment. Uh, Dick and Carol Kennedy have finally seen the light. Um, they've moved their membership from the Methodist Church over here to, to Calvary Assembly of God, and we want to welcome them as members. So thank you. <laughs> but what, what am I saying? There, there's a sense that some people want to get out. They got stuff to do. And then there's people that got nowhere to go. They're milling around, making small talk. Your stomach's growling. You're like, I want to go to Golden Corral too. I should have left with them. But there you are in ministry, and you don't flinch. I know, I'm giving you the backstory. I'm sorry. I'm human. But there, 
There's a door right there, and sometimes I use it as an escape. Because ministry can be exhausting, and then there's people that don't leave. Why am I telling you that? Well, Jesus sent his workers away into a boat. He's got a crowd of 5,000 plus people. I don't know how long it takes to dismiss that crowd. Some of them are out. Some of them got nowhere to go. And just in case you were wondering if Jesus is worried about his disciples entering a boat after a long day of ministry and being tired, it says here he went to a prayer meeting. <laughs> so, you know, if you, if you study the history of Jesus, his prayer meetings are not like, God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our food, amen. He talks with the Father for hours. Hours in the presence of his Father. Where were his disciples? Potter! 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 We're going to die! Potter! They're straining at rowing. Jesus can see them from his mountaintop prayer, and he still doesn't go. I mean, I, I'm reading this, I'm like, God is so good. <laughs> I mean, you can read the story or you can get the backstory and say, what is going on here? You've got the disciples, they're struggling. They thought they got dismissed. They didn't get dismissed. They were out for the workout of their life. Straining, rowing, harder, harder. And then finally it says about the fourth watch of the night. Now if you don't know how Israeli time works, that means nothing to you. So let's, let's check it out. The Israeli watches of the night are from 6, watch number one is from 6 to 9 p.m. Watch number two is from 9 to 12 Watch number three is from 12 to 3 a.m. And the fourth watch of the night is from 3 a.m. to 6. So, previous to the verses we read, it said, uh, while they were feeding the disciples, one of them said, or the disciples were, were uh, feeding, it says that the, the night was far spent, or the day was far spent. Now, I'm guessing... It's got to be between 6 and 9 p.m. It's got to be reaching into the first watch of the night when he dismisses the disciples. So I don't know what's going on from 9 o'clock to 3 a.m. except for paddle! Paddle harder! Because the winds are contrary. Uh, they're being bounced to and fro by the waves. Water is getting into the boat. And there's only one thought, we're going to die. Why does Jesus wait till the fourth watch of the night? Come on, how many of you have ever been there? You're like, God, when are you going to show up? Grandma says you're always with her. I can't feel you. I don't see it. I've got no evidence. What's going on? Through many dangers, toil, and snare. We've already come. Grace has brought us safe this far. And grace will lead you home. See, when you think he should have shown up, he says, I'm already there, son. I'm already there, daughter. My grace is with you. You should be dead. But you're not. My grace is with you. We sing a song in this church, your grace is enough. Is it? Is it enough when you know that it comes with waves and pounding and tumult and it feels like God isn't there, but he's been watching from the mountaintop all along? He knows your toil. He knows your snare. He, he knows your danger. And he says, grace. Grace, child. Grace. And then he comes up on the water's edge and he says, having a rough time out there. 
And what they're having a rough time in, I'm going to walk on. That's good preaching. What they're struggling in, I'm going to come walking on. See, your struggle is his red carpet, and he just wants you to recognize that it's also yours. Right. It's walking you to your destiny. It's just what are you doing with this moment? How are you handling the reality of what is happening? So if you uh, are like me and you're like, all right, I want to read Mark, I want to read Matthew, I want to read John, you start to get a fuller picture of how God begins to operate. Because not all three gospel writers tell the story the same way. And you start to get a picture that, all right, you know, Peter says, if it's you, Lord, bring me out on the water. You know, that's an interesting moment that just preceded Peter's question because they feared that it was a ghost. Now, I mean, put yourself in their shoes. Here you are struggling, straining, you're emotionally spent, you're physically drained, and now a haunting on the Sea of Galilee. Just what I need. A ghost. The sea is haunted. I have people tell me that all the time. Straight in my face. I swear the place I stayed last week, haunted. Haunted. Oh, you meant you felt the presence of demons. I see. You, you weren't haunted. But see, this, this has been around for a long time. People see stuff and they're like, it's a ghost. Well, it's either demonic presence or it's the spirit of the living God. You've got to figure out what. So Peter tested. Is that you, Lord? If it's you, tell me to come on the water. And he does. And Peter walks on water. Now, I know we all fault him for falling in, but, I mean, come on. How many of you have walked on water? Yeah, like, he did it. He, he walked on water. To me, that's, that's the first thing right there. That God is saying, I've been watching you from the mountaintop all along. I have seen your struggles. I poured out my grace, and it still wasn't enough for you. So I got up to the water's edge, and I saw you. And I came out on the fourth watch of the night. I know you've been toiling. I know you've been struggling. I know it's been difficult. I'm going to walk out to you. I love how it says here that he would have walked by. That's the God we serve. He will walk by if you don't cry out. Come on, church, that's good. I mean, he can be above you, praying over you. He can be at water's edge looking over you. He can be right next to you and you can miss all three. Will you cry out to him, Lord, is that you? God, it's you. I can feel your presence in this place. God, it's you. And it doesn't have to be in a place where the music is just right and the air conditioning is just as comfortable. No, he can show up in this and say, I'm right here. Do you see me yet? Do you see me now? Do you understand I'm here? I've always been here. I've never left you and I haven't forsaken you. Do you see me? And Peter says, I see the moment. I seize this moment. God, it's you. And he walks on water. Now what took Peter down? Does anyone remember? He looked at the boisterousness of the water. He took his eyes off of Jesus and looked back at what most people love to describe their problem. The problem seized Peter and down he goes. And Jesus is there still and he says, Peter, why did you doubt? Now here comes the next part. John says that immediately when Jesus gets in the boat, two things happen. One, the storm stops. What? Sometimes you read this and you're like, all right, did I just read that? Jesus gets in the boat because he's on the water. He's walking on stormy water. He rescues Peter out of stormy water and they get in the boat together and everything dies down. And you've got to say the whole thing has got to be a setup. Isaiah 54. I created the blacksmith. I created the fire. I created the one to make the instrument. I created all of these, the spoiler and the destroyer. 
no weapon forged against you will prosper. Isn't it a setup? Look at your life and say, it's a setup. I've been set up. Because as soon as he gets in the seat next to you, it all dies down. The next part shocked me. It says in John that immediately their ship was at its destination. What they had been struggling, God, we're going to die. No! What we can't do in our own power, God can take you to your destiny immediately. Come on, right? Propelled. The, the forward motion of God is not without waves. It's not without tumult. It's not without all of that. And even in the middle of it, you better be talking to God. Right. Wrecking now. Where is he right now? Oh, he's praying his grace over me. God, this is awful. You know, I tried to take my kids for snow cones the other night, and for some reason, the minute we got in the car, the skies just rained raindrops. I think about this large. I said, come on, God, snow cones. We're trying to go over to that pelican place. We just want some snow cones. Can you make it stop? And as soon as I said that, it rained harder. And you got the kids kicking your seat in the back. When are we getting out? I don't know. I don't know. Tomorrow? <laughs> Camp here for a while? It's like the parking lot's starting to fill up. I don't, I don't know, guys. I guess this is an exercise in patience. Lord, help me to not commit suicide <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Life doesn't stop. The situations don't, don't stop. And you know what God's saying right there in that moment? My grace over you. My grace over you, son. One day they'll grow up and be out of the house. It'll be just you and Tammy. It'll be wonderful. Through many dangerous <laughs> toys and snow. People always come up to me in the supermarket. You'll be all right, sir. You'll be all right. Here's a hanky. It will be behind us. I'm trying to say the same. It will be behind you. It's all part of your story. You've been set up by God. I promise you, you've been set up by God. And what a story you have. You overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the power of of your testimony. You overcame. Onward, Christian soldier. And I look at this and say, all right, God, what, 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 are, we, what are we supposed to get out of this? And, and all I could come up with as I'm talking to the Lord is, well, you can either sit there and get pummeled, or you can see it as the handiwork of God shaping you and forming you to see where He is in any circumstance. I'm going to ask the worship team to come. I'm going to ask you all to stand. And I, I don't want this to be a, an if altar call. I want us all to come. If you have the bravery to just fill up this whole front, I want to call you all to the altar. Because life is challenging. Life will give you circumstances that are designed to knock you down. Don't be afraid. Come on up, everybody. I just want to pray that you're able to not just get pummeled, but to come out on the other side of this thing, high-fiving brothers and sisters in Christ to say, we did it, Marsha. We made it. We are victorious on the other side of what we designed to take us down. We'll scoot up there. There's still more people coming. Now, if you're not afraid, this is old-fashioned Pentecost here. Lay hands on the person next to you. Pray for them. 
There's plenty of room down here. You can scoot this way. Look at you. You're all warriors. Battle scarred. Challenged. Difficult. You've been through stuff. And God says, I was with you. I didn't forsake you. My grace was over you. Then he moves to the shoreline of your life. He says, I see you struggling. I see the wind is adversary against you. But if God be for you, who can be against you? Now I'm coming to you. This is the crucial part, church. Will you call out to him? This is our moment. He is here. Hallelujah. He's in this place. Will you cry out to the living God? Let's do it together. Father, we don't, we don't want to miss you. We don't want to miss you passing by. We see you, Lord. High and lifted up. We exalt you. We glorify you. We know that you are God and you are in this place. We cry out to you knowing that it's you. Call us to the miraculous. Call us to the transformation of our life. That what was designed to knock us down is now the red carpet to our destiny. That you will lead us in the path of righteousness for your name's sake. Empower us, Almighty God. Not by might. Not by power. But by your Spirit, Almighty God. Fill us, Lord. That we will be overcomers in this life. More than conquerors. Able to recognize, God, you're at work here. You've not turned your back on me. You're right here with me. God, I pray that our sense, our knowledge, our instruments of the Spirit would be at work knowing God is here. That we would worship you at all times. That praise would be on our lips. Complaints would exit. Worship would enter. And we would be transformed by the glory of God. That our circumstances now are clearly viewed in light of what you are doing. That you are creating our testimony which will, we, will be told others will hear and be delivered and set free. Father, use this congregation in a powerful way at whatever stage in the game they are. Heal, restore, refresh, renew, revitalize your children that they may exit this place with new perspective and empowered by your spirit. Father, we ask this accomplished in Jesus' name.